Hey everyone, welcome back to PS Platter. First, today we're going to be having a look at the examination of the renal system, the physical exam of the renal system. So let's get started. So when it comes to examining the renal system, we're going to be having a look about the renal and urinary system. And as usual, we're going to be going through our step-by-step -step process, starting off with general inspection, looking at the patient as they come in, um, having a look at their vitals, having a look at their upper limbs, uh, face, neck, leg, spine, and then come to the abdomen. We're going to be doing a lot more inspection, closer inspection, um, palpation, percussion, auscultation. And we're going to be talking about all of that in the context of what conditions and pathologies and um, how you can make links between certain signs and underlying disease processes when we come to those slides. So let's start off with um, general inspection. So on general inspection, renal exam, which is a renal instead of GIT there, but on the renal exam, you should um, look first of all for visible pain. And that can be sort of um, more subtle with, with the person maybe grimacing a little in pain or maybe leaning away from the side that's painful. Um, or it can be a lot more severe where the person is in agonizing pain and squirming around in the chair. Um, but either way, you don't you really don't want to miss this, visit, this sign, or at least you want to point out when you're doing your OSCE that the person is not in any visible pain, because that's, again, a very important finding. Um, then you might want to look for certain signs that are more specific for particular conditions that are related to the kidneys. So I like grouping it up into two conditions, the first one being CKD and the second one being UTI, you know, tract infections. So with CKD or chronic kidney disease, you can expect some um, hyperventilation maybe, and that's because of metabolic acidosis um, uh, with that kidney dysfunction. So a buildup of acid within um, the blood and your body's gonna try and compensate by trying to blow off some CO2 so that your blood's pH goes back up and becomes less acidic. And so you're gonna have some hyperventilation, so respiratory combina uh, compensation um, leading to hyper hyperventilation. That can be one sign. You also have signs of uremia. So again, uremia being um, retention of uh, uric acid or urea. Um, and as a result, you can end up with things like hiccups, um, uremic fetor, which is basically a fancy way of saying a really fishy breath, um, and uremic tinge. So that's where you have a sort of sallow complexion, and you might be able to see that on the image on the right there. Um, and you can also have uh, a person being drowsy or confused, because again, you, you remember that the um, urea is a toxin, um, and you can also have some dehydration. And in terms of dehydration, you might look for things like um, dry mucous membranes um, and skin turgor being lost. Um, then when you come to UTIs, you can look for specific signs like a ketone-like smell. So um, some uh, textbooks describe that when you walk into the room, you can there's a distinctive ketone-like smell, which I haven't had any experience with yet. But I'm told that it's very like uh, it's very very obvious, and it's usually linked with the uh, UTI, for example. Um, and the second thing you can look for is signs of urinary incontinence. So maybe the uh, with the younger child, they might have wet their pants. Um, and so that can be, again, a sign that there's some sort of pathology going on in the urinary tract or the bladder, which is irritating it and causing the person to have urinary incontinence. Um, all right, then with the renal exam, we move on from your um, general inspection and have a look at the vitals. So um, in terms of the vitals, you'd be concerned about them because temperature is in any sort of setting, whether it be renal, gastro, whatever system you're looking at, temperature, whenever you have a high temperature or a fever, you want to think about infection. So it's really important that you keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about the vitals. Then you can have a look at blood pressure as well. So they can, you know, they can be hypertensive, hypertensive, and you typically have hypertension and CKD because um, as the disease progresses, you have a reduction in GFR or glomerular uh, filtration rate. And so you're going to be able to get rid of water less. You're not going to be able to get rid of um, the blood volume as efficiently. And so you're going to have a buildup of water in the blood um, leading to hypertension. Um, with the upper limbs, uh, you can have a look um, in the nails for leukonychia. So that's sort of leuko being white, nikia being male. So like white streaks on the nails. Um, and that can be a sign of hypoalbumin, hypoalbuminemia, um, which can point towards nephrotic syndrome, which is underlying that. So we have a lot of excess protein loss from uh, those damaged nephrons. Then you can have a look at their palms. And in terms of their palms, you can look for signs of pallor. So um, uh, the palmar creases can be wider than, than usual, uh, and that can be a sign of anemia, 
And again, anemia makes sense in the context of CKD because if you have a diseased kidney, it's not going to be producing erythropoietin as effectively. And so you're going to have um, reduced production of red blood cells and therefore anemia stemming off that. Um, later on in hematology, you'll be learning about types of anemia. So don't worry about this too much here, but the type of anemia you'll encounter with CKD with an EPO deficiency is gonna be a normal cytic type. Um, and that'll make more sense later on. So don't worry about it too much here. Um, then when you move on to their wrists, you will you can have a look for asterixis. Um, and you might remember us talking about that earlier um, with the hepatic flap in the GIT exam. It's a very similar pathophase here as well. Again, you have ammonia retention, but um, this time it's not because of any hepatic pathology or liver pathology. It's because those kidneys are not effectively filtering out the ammonia, you're retaining it, and that's resulting in this um, flap. Next, you have the um, elbows. And at the elbows, you can do your usual um, checking for blood pressure. Um, again, you would have already asked um, in the vital section for the blood pressure, but, um, but you can, if you're doing this in the context of a real patient, you can measure the blood pressure at this point. Um, then you can check for fistulas, which you can um, palpate and feel for, or you can sometimes make them out uh, visually. So you can see on the on the image on the on the right there that sort of um, lump or bump in the surface of the skin that indicates an underlying arteriovenous fistula, and they can be a sign that someone has CKD because an arteriovenous fistula is artificially made for the purposes of dialysis. So. Um, that can be another indication of the person has CKD if they don't already mention it or if it's not already clear. Um, skin changes wise, you can see um, them scratch marks and scratch marks are again something you would have covered um, in the context of jaundice. Um, but also here is that when you have uremia or um, retention of uh, the urea, you can actually end up with uh, itchiness as a result of that. So you get uremic pruritus or itchiness because of urea retention. You can also have bruising and your textbook cites the reason for the bruising as being because of nitrogen retention. So if you retain that nitrogen, it actually messes up the platelets uh, and the way they clot. So you actually get um, easy bruising. Um, and the final sign there is not very high yield because apparently it's not very commonly come across in clinical practice, but it's uremic frost. Um, that's where if you have a lot of urea building up in the body, you can actually precipitate onto the skin and form this um, frost-like or snowy-like layer of um, sedimentation or like um, over the skin. And that can be, again, a sign of severe uremia. Next up in the renal exam, you move on to your head and neck. And with the head and neck, as usual, we'd look in the eyes. So in the eyes, we'd look for pallor. Um, so that's paleness um, and that uh, of the conjunctiva. And that'll be a sign maybe of anemia. And we talked about why anemia would happen in, in um, CKD. That's because you have uh, reduced erythropoietin production. You can rarely have jaundice occurring, but it's very um, unlikely. Um, what can happen is when you have excess nitrogen being retained, it can actually lead to hemolysis and that leads to um, jaundice. Uh, so uh, pre-hepatic jaundice. Um, and you can also have a look at um, the fundi or um, the eyes um, with an ophthalmoscope and the um, key sign you look for there um, is band keratopathy. Um, when it comes to the neck, you can have a listen um, and have a look. So if you're having a look, you can look at the JVP. Um, and again, the JVP is an indication of um, a number of things, the, uh, one of them being the pressure in the right atrium, but also um, as a consequence, uh, if you have any excess fluid in your blood, uh, in your bloodstream. So if you have elevated fluid retention, which you might have in CKD, where your, the, uh, your kidneys have um, GFR going down, and so they're not being able to filter out fluid as uh, effectively, and so you have buildup of fluid in the blood and therefore increased pressures in the right atrium, you can expect to see a rise in the JVP um, above the typical three centimeters that it tends to stay below. Um, with breweries, you can have a listen at the neck for carotid breweries and you will cover how to do that in the cardiovascular exam. The reason we even care about that in the context of a renal uh, condition is that if someone has demonstrated a carotid brewery, that means they have atherosclerosis um, of that uh, carotid artery. And we'd be concerned because um, atherosclerosis in that region might point to 
systemic atherosclerosis and like disease in other locations as well. For example, it could be in the renal arteries causing renal stenosis and therefore um, kidney pathology. And that's how it all links up. With your lower limbs, you can look for pitting edema. And again, that's to do with fluid retention. If you have um, fluid being retained in the context of CKD, it'll, it can, um, by, because of gravity, it'll pull into the legs um, and cause pitting edema there. Pitting, um, meaning that when you press down on it, it'll create a little pit there that will take some time to return back to its normal um, structure. And that indicates that it's fluid underlying it, um, which is causing that uh, edema. Then you have your back. And with the back, you're mainly going to be focusing on the spine. Um, you can palpate along the spine. And if there's tenderness, it can be due to something called renal osteodystrophy. Not too important to know about. Um, but another important thing to keep in mind, however, is Murphy's kidney punch, which sounds really brutal, but it's actually a, um, a maneuver that's done to check for um, tenderness at the renal angle or the costovertebral angle. Um, it's sort of a little gap where you can um, punch or palpate and that can allow you to shake the kidneys a little bit. And so if you do that renal punch uh, properly and you get tenderness at that area, um, renal tenderness, then that can point to an underlying renal pathology, specifically um, more so towards a renal infection. Um, then with your renal exam, you also have uh, the inspection component. So with inspections, you can look for scars and you learn about those scars more in your lectures as well. But the scars you can look for is the scar for nephrectomy, the scars for renal transplant, and the scars that are used for peritoneal dialysis, um, all of which you'll come to learn about. You can also look for bulges and distension. So you might see a bit of a, a lump um, or um, distended abdomen, and that can point to polycystic kidneys or even you know, things like ascites from nephrotic syndrome, um, which you can confirm in the percussion section with shifting dullness. We'll come to that in a second. You can also do palpation. So palpation um, with, an abdomen, with the abdomen, you do, um, as usual, light and deep touch all over the abdomen, those um, nine different areas. Um, you also blot the kidneys, so you would have learned the bio, you'll learn about the biomanual method of blotting the kidneys. Um, that's, I think, quite clearly explained um, in your classes. So you won't go over it too much here, but essentially, you put one hand under um, on the back and one hand on top, and you sort of push the kidneys up towards your top hand so you can catch them. And if they're enlarged, you'll be able to feel them. Or if you have a particularly thinner patient, you'll be able to feel them as well. But usually, you won't be able to feel. Um, the kidneys when you're blotting them, um, similar to the liver and spleen, you, you normally don't you normally don't feel them as well uh, when you're palpating them in the person without pathology, but you would still palpate for the liver and spleen here again because um, if you're having, for example, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, that could point towards fluid retention um, again in the context of CKD maybe. Um, you might also be able to palpate the bladder. I put the words full bladder here because when you have an empty collapsed bladder you're probably not going to be able to palpate that at all. But if your, the bladder is full, you might be able to palpate it um, and feel it um, in, um, super pubically. Um, in terms of percussion, you can have a look at the bladder and percuss it. Um, if it's full, you should hear the stony dullness because there's fluid inside of it. Um, and then you can also percuss, again, like we said, if you have a distended abdomen and you think there might be some sort of ascites, you can do the shifting dullness test um, to check if there is in fact underlying fluid. So that, that again being um, putting your fingers on top of the abdomen and percussing over it and checking that you do in fact have fluid there and then turning them over to the side and seeing if the fluid sort of collects uh, because of gravity to the bottom. And then on top, we should um, again have the fluid away from the top area and therefore have hyper resonance there. Um, that's described more clearly again in the GIT exam video. So you can have a look at it there. But then finally, you can end with auscultation. And auscultation, you'd um, again be looking for breweries. Um, uh, again, that would point towards renal stenosis. And that's um, another pathology you want to keep your eye out for. Um, when it comes to aortic and renal breweries, um, the main thing you have to keep in mind for renal breweries is that when you're listening for them, you have to, um, the Latin map you use is you start at the umbilicus, you go slightly above it and then two centimeters lateral you know, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side to listen to both of the um, renal arteries and check for any breweries there. Um, and the aortic one, again, you would have covered um, in the gastro exam. So it's very much similar to the gastro exam. 
um, but you're sort of focusing here more on on the kidneys and looking for renal pathologies. But again, as I said before, you're still checking like you know the liver, the spleen, doing a light and deep touch as you normally would, um, just to check that you don't have any other pathologies that might be happening or going on. So that's it for the renal exam. I hope you found that useful. And again, if you have any questions, feedback or concerns, let us know in the comments or send us a message directly and we'll try and address them. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next one.